In today's lecture, we're going to begin our introduction to the human body. There's two main things we're going to focus on today. First, an overview of anatomy, and then second, delve into something called gross anatomy. As always, before you proceed to the next lecture, make sure you understand these learning objectives here, and then these learning objectives here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started talking about an overview of anatomy. So the first question you want to ask yourself is, why would we study human anatomy? What's the point? You know, how is anatomy important in your life, right? Well, first of all, how is it important in your job? Well, if you're interested in becoming a physician or a nurse or an athletic trainer, uh, anything in the health profession, you could a physical therapist, for example, you could really see how human anatomy is very important, obviously. So human anatomy is very important in that regard. But let's look at other things as well. Even if you're not going to the health professions, it's very important throughout your life in terms of leisure activities. Uh, physical fitness is shown to help you physically, mentally, emotionally throughout your life. And it's important that you understand the human body uh, and how to maintain it so you can enjoy these activities throughout your life. And then finally, all of us at some point will encounter a situation where we're sick, we have to go to the doctor, and we really want to be able to communicate to our doctor uh, in an appropriate manner. Make sure we can describe what's going wrong with our body and make sure that the physician is able to uh, explain to us what's going on and how we can fix the situation. And if we both have an understanding of human anatomy, that will really help facilitate that type of discussion. Okay, so the next question we want to delve into is how are anatomy and physiology related? So we're going to really focus on anatomy, but we cannot ignore something that's called physiology as well. Let's look at this. So what is anatomy? So anatomy is the study or the of the structure or form of the human body. In other words, saying, what is this? What is that? That's a hand. This is a clavicle bone. Uh, you know, this is your skin, that type of thing. A very closely related field is something called physiology, and this is the study of body function. So in other words, not only is that a clavicle bone, but how is it formed? What does it do? You know, not only is that your bicep muscle, but how does the bicep muscle perform? So you could see that although we're focusing on anatomy, it's not just enough to identify something. You have to have some idea as well in terms of what it does, in terms of its physiology, in terms of its function. So if we look at the two, we say structure and function, we would always say that, you know, function follows structure, right? The way something is formed, the structure, enables it to provide a certain function to the body. And the two are very intricately related, as you can see. So that's what arrow's representing. You can't look at one without looking at the other. Okay, a quick example of that. If we look at the human eye, which we'll cover much later on in a different lecture, you could see that we have something here called the cornea, right? And the cornea is this transparent tissue at the surface of the eye. It's very important that it's transparent. That's the anatomy, that's the structure. Why is it important? Well, if it's transparent, then it can allow light to pass through it, and that helps you see. So you can see that's a classical case of uh, function following structure, and it shows the interplay between anatomy and physiology. Also, when we talk about anatomy, we really want to make sure we understand the different functional levels uh, that we can study anatomy at the organismal level and then uh, below the organismal level as well. So for example, uh, whenever we start talking about you know, anatomy or biology in general, we start at the chemical level, right? the atoms, the molecules that are used to form these structures. We can up it to the cellular level. The cell is the basic unit of life. Uh, often has a membrane, as you could see here, this phospholipid membrane, uh, which forms the outer uh, lining of a cell. And that allows that barrier allows for different chemical reactions to proceed back and forth across the membrane. You'll see that as a theme throughout uh, this course, throughout our lectures. We also talk about the issue of the tissue level, right? And then go to the organ level, the organ system level, and then finally the organismal level. So um, this is sort of an overview slide showing you the different levels and we'll encounter them throughout this, uh, throughout this course and throughout these lectures. Okay, so in anatomy and in science in general, we use something called the metric system. It's a way of measuring things. So we don't use inches or feet like we do in the United States. Uh, rather in science and in most of the world, we use something called the metric system. So for example, if we look at the bottom of the screen here and we have this little scale bar here, this is about half the length of this individual. Uh, if someone's six feet tall, they're a little under two meters, so that bar would represent a meter. If we go a little bit smaller here, we put a new scale bar, and this one I have to highlight because it's very tiny, but right there, that little red bar, that would represent something called a centimeter, right, or one one hundredth of a meter. If we go even further down, we can talk about something called a micrometer, and I can't even draw the scale bar here because it's too small, but if we focus on the micrometer and the nucleus of a given cell might be around 10 micrometers or so to give you an idea, a micrometer is one one millionth of a meter, so 10 to the negative sixth, and this is something you'll encounter throughout the course. So if we look at common measurements, we might say a liter as uh, a unit of volume, right? A milliliter is one one thousandth of that. 
Uh, we're very familiar with these, uh, like a liter of Coke, for example, or maybe um, if you're giving medicine to a small child, you might measure that medicine in milliliters. We could talk about a gram, right? We're weighing food, let's say, or a kilogram, which is a thousand grams. So these are units that we use, you know, throughout anatomy, and you'll see them many, many times uh, throughout our lectures. Okay, so when the rubber hits the road, what do you have to know here? What's going to be on the test? Uh, number one, we want to focus on learning, but I think it's quite naive to not consider what's on the test. Right? That's very important as well. It's a practical consideration we have to consider. So certainly let's not obsess with what's on the test, but it would be very wise to know, you know what we will be tested on. And so if we look at this chart, really the thing I'm focusing on here is this highlighted portion where I have the red box around it. If you know those values, those abbreviations, and then the multiplier, right, in terms of, you know, how high or how low those prefixes uh, enable the number to go, uh, that would be sufficient for an anatomy course, I think. It's a solid uh, foundation. Okay, so let's talk about how anatomical terms are named. Well, a lot of these names come from the ancient Greek or from Latin, right, from the Roman Empire. For example, uh, arm comes from the word brachium in Greek. Thigh comes from the word femur in Latin. And it's really important that we use these terms because we need a standard nomenclature worldwide. In other words, there's you know probably hundreds or maybe thousands of languages spoken throughout the world. And if a physician or anyone from one country is talking to another physician or anyone else from another country, you have to know what part of the body you're talking about. And so by using this common language, this common nomenclature is the word we use of ancient Greek and Latin, we have a very standard way of naming things. Okay, so that's a little overview of anatomy. Now I'd like to focus on something called gross anatomy. So what is gross anatomy? Is it disgusting? Well, sometimes, right? <laughs> but really what gross means is large. Right? So gross anatomy is something you can see with your eye, and it's something uh, that you don't need the aid of an instrument to see. So we don't need a microscope. Right? If we need a microscope, that's microscopic anatomy. But if we can look at it with the eye, that's gross anatomy. So for example, if we're naming the different muscles throughout the body, that would be gross anatomy, something we could see with our naked eye. And we'll encounter both of these uh, as we continue on in our anatomy course. Okay, so what approaches are used to study gross anatomy? Well, there's two main ones I want to focus on. Uh, we'll use one of these two, and then I will mention something as a side note as well, a third approach that's often used. So the first one is something called regional anatomy. And regional anatomy is where we're focusing on a given region, right, or area of the body. So for example, if we were focusing on the head region here, uh, if we were focusing on the muscles, the nerves, uh, the bones, all in the head region, that would be regional anatomy. Uh, really, that's something that you would learn if you went to medical school or graduate school. Uh, for example, a surgeon might really have to know regional anatomy very well because if they're operating on your, draw, your jaw, let's say they're cracking your upper jaw to expand it or repairing a jaw that was broken, you know, I hope they would know what muscles are there or what nerves are there. Otherwise, they might be cutting through muscles and damaging nerves that are very important uh, for, for movement of your face. So regional anatomy is very important, but it's something that we maybe study more at an upper level. What we're going to use in this course is something called systemic anatomy. So by systemic anatomy, what we mean is we're covering one system at a time. So for example, we might start by focusing on the cardiovascular system, right? Looking at uh, the system that has all these common uh, attributes. So in other words, we have the heart, we have the blood vessels pumping blood through the body. That's a really great approach uh, to use because it's very good in relating structure to function. So it's a great way to introduce uh, someone to anatomy. So it's something that we really use at the undergraduate level. Something else I want to mention, and it's covered by my little icons in the bottom left here, but I think you could probably uh, see it okay, is that there's another uh, approach to anatomy called surface anatomy. And this is using uh, surface structures or markings to reveal underlying organs. Uh, it's something that a physician might use during an exam. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later on in this lecture. But in this course, again, just to emphasize, we're really going to be focusing on the systemic anatomy. It's a good approach to use to relate structure to function. Okay, so what are the body's organ systems and their major functions? Well, here's six out of the 12 that we're going to be studying. I'll let you read through these on your own. And you might say, okay, at this stage in the game, what do I have to know? Well, really what you have to know at this stage in the game is I'd like you to be able to identify each of these systems. What are they? What are the names? And then just the one or two sentence uh, description that's provided on this slide. Later on in this course, we're going to be going much more in depth into each of these. But for the first lecture here, I want you to understand these basics so you know in general what each system does and what it's called. 
Here are six more systems, and the same thing applies to this slide. So again, just make sure you know the labels that are on this slide and the descriptions uh, that go with each picture. And we'll talk about these more throughout the course. Okay, so when we talk about gross anatomy, we really want to know where something is located. And we have to use objective standards, right? We can't just say it's over there, over here, or it's up, or it's down. Because when you think about it, those terms might easily be confused. So really what we're doing here is we need to first say, okay, what is the specimen or what is the subject going to look like? You know, uh, in other words, they always have to be in the same location or the same orientation. We can't have someone laying down, someone standing up, uh, someone curled up in the fetal position. How are we going to describe where we're going with that, you know, in terms of uh, for operating on someone? We wouldn't know. So really in anatomy, we have something that's called the anatomical position. And it looks something like this. So you'll see an individual looking right back at you from the computer here. That person is in the anatomical position. You'll notice that that person's feet are flat on the ground. The toys are pointed straight at you. You'll also notice that the palms here are facing towards you, right? And the palms are open and the person's looking directly at you. That's the anatomical position. And when we're in that position, we want to be able to know right from left. This is right. This is left. And you might say, wait a second, are those labels switched? The answer is no, they're not, right? In the atom anatomical position, when we say right, we mean the person's right, right? The subject being studied, their right. So not your right, but their right. So that's why this is right over here, and then this is left over here. Okay, so how do we know what region of the body something's located in? Well, there's a few different things we want to note here. So the first is we could have something called the anterior side of the body or the posterior side of the body. Uh, ventral and dorsal really apply more to animals, right, uh, that are walking on four limbs. So uh, anterior and ventral are basically synonyms, posterior and dorsal are basically synonyms. But in this course, I'm going to talk about anterior for the human and then posterior for the human. So the anterior position is this. It's the front of someone's body, while the posterior position is the back of somebody's body. Also, we can say, what is the axial region of someone's body? And the axial region is really saying their trunk, right, saying their trunk. So that's really what you're talking about, the trunk or the center portion of the body, like it's an axis, right? So that's the axial region. If we look at the axial region a bit further, we could say it's divided into different categories. So the thoracic region is sort of the chest region. The abdomen is, you know, where your uh, belly button is, that region, and your ab muscles, right, your abdominal muscles. And um, also we could say that there's the back region, right? And so if someone's looking, you're looking at the posterior side, you can see the back region. Again, we use these so we can talk about which organs are lying in certain parts of the body. Okay, if we get a little more technical, if we're talking about the head, we call it the cephalic region. If we're talking about the neck, we call it the cervical region. Thoracic is going to be the chest. Abdominal, that's sort of a common word, so we're sort of used to that, right? The abdominal region. Pelvic region is just below the abdominal region. Then finally, the pubic region or the genital region. You could see these on uh, the posterior view as well. So I'll just have those sort of pop up there. Okay, the next region I want to talk about is something called the appendicular region. And the appendicular region, what we're saying by that is we're saying the limbs, the individual's limbs, their arms and legs. So we could talk about the upper limb, the manus or the hand. Manus in uh, Latin means hand. Uh, it's also my understanding that I think mono in Spanish means hand. So you could see that languages that have derived from Latin or from ancient Greek, if someone knows those languages, they're really at an advantage uh, when they talk about human anatomy. Because if you know mono means hand in Spanish, then you know what hand is. So it's really helpful if you have some basis in Latin or uh, ancient Greek or any language that derived from those. Okay, we could talk about the lower limb. That's also part of the appendicular region. And then the pedal or the foot. Okay, so how do we know what direction we're referring to? Right? How do we know what direction we're referring to? If a surgeon's ready to operate, we can't just say go that way or go this way. It might get very confusing, right? You want to make sure that they're operating on the correct region of the body. So we use some very precise terms when we're talking about human anatomy, and they come in pairs. So I encourage you to think of them in pairs. The first pair is this. If we say something is superficial, we're saying it's toward the head. If we say it's inferior, I'm sorry, I, say super, I think I misspoke. <laughs> if we say it's superior, it's towards the head. If we say inferior, we mean towards the feet. Let's look at some other directions. If we say medial, we're saying it's along the center axis of the individual, right? That's medial. If we say it's lateral, we're going towards the side here. If something is proximal, we're saying it's at the portion of the limb where it merges with the axial region of the body. So the shoulder would be proximal. Distal would be going down here. So the hand would be distal, right? So the hand would be distal toward to the shoulder, sort of the way we would describe it. 
If we say ipsilateral, we're talking about two structures that are on the same side of the body. So the right hand is ipsilateral to the right foot. If we say contralateral, we're saying they're on the opposite sides of the body. So the right hand is contralateral to the left foot. Anterior and posterior, we talked about those a little bit already. Uh, superficial and deep. Superficial is sort of on the outer surface of the body, so the skin would be superficial. Deep would be saying we're going into the body more, so the heart would be deep to the skin, you know, something like that. So it's very important to know these directional terms when we talk about human anatomy. Okay, if we're making a cut through someone, how do we know what plane we're cutting in? Again, very important when we're talking about anatomy, if you're going to have a surgery, uh, or even if you're describing something to your physician. So there's three main planes we want to talk about here. Uh, the first plane is something called the sagittal plane or the mid-sagittal plane. Either one's fine. And that's if you're taking a uh, knife or a scalpel and you're cutting right down the middle of someone's body in terms of uh, you'd be separating their left eye from their right eye. Uh, so really it's like dividing the left and the right portions of their body. right? So you're cutting right down the middle of the sternum. That's a sagittal plane or a sagittal cut. If you're talking about a frontal plane, what that is, is you're making a cut where you would just have the front portion of someone's body or the anterior portion. A transverse plane would be if you're cutting the upper part of the body from the lower part of the body. So the superficial from the, I'm sorry, I keep saying superficial, <laughs> the superior, right, from the inferior. And so that would be something that would be a transverse plane or transverse cut. So it's important to know these. And these are just different sections that result from those cuts. I wouldn't worry about those particular um, pictures that popped up just now. We'll talk about those later in the course. The important thing from this slide is that you know the planes. Okay, so what are some highlights of the human body plan? Uh, really, we're going to focus on human anatomy throughout this course, right, and throughout this lecture. Uh, but you want to understand how the human body has evolved and how it relates to other organisms. And this can really be seen in the highlights of the human body plan. And there's six highlights I want to talk about right here. So the first is that the human body can be considered a tube within a tube. When I say tube within a tube, what the heck is that? Well, the first tube is going to be the digestive system. The second tube is going to be the outer portion of the body. That's what we mean by tube within a tube. It's a basic body plan that you see in humans as well as many other orga organisms. The second is that humans have bilateral symmetry. So if you were to make a sagittal cut through an individual, the left side of their body looks just like the right side of their body. The next one is that humans have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. And by this, what we mean is uh, you basically have this spinal cord, right? Uh, and basically, uh, as the, organ, the uh, organism develops or the human develops, that becomes that, that um, dorsal hollow nerve cord becomes the brain and the spinal cord. Humans also, at least at the embryo stage, have a, nort a notochord and vertebrate. And the notochord is something that's a little bit hard to understand because adult humans, you don't really see it and it's not very visible. Uh, but the notochord is found in uh, all organisms that are considered chordates. Uh, that term chordate is not something we're going to focus on a lot, so I wouldn't worry about it, but I mention it just so you, you hear it. Uh, and the notochord is derived from something called the mesoderm. It's a type of tissue. The notochord is always ventral to the nerve cord. And what happens is as the human develops, so at the embryonic stage, you can see the notochord, but as the human develops and becomes an adult human, uh, what happens is that notochord is replaced by the vertebral column. Humans also have segmentation. What do we mean by segmentation? Well, we mean the human body is composed of repeating units. So what are these units? Well, you could see it in the vertebrate, right? We have repeating vertebrate down the spinal cord. Also, you could see it in the ribs, right? You have repeating ribs. That's what we mean by segmentation. And then finally, humans have pharyngeal pouches. And uh, again, it's something that's really seen more at the embryonic stage, though it does uh, yield other structures later on. Uh, in fish, the pharyngeal pouches become the gills. Okay? Now, humans obviously don't have gills, but what these pouches uh, basically lead to later on are uh, parts of the inner ear and then also uh, certain uh, structures like the parathyroid glands. Uh, so so uh, humans do have pharyngeal pouches, but they basically uh, lead into other structures as the humans develop. So why do we talk about this body plan? Well, it gives you a general perspective in terms of uh, how we classify the human body, you know, what qualities it has. 
But also uh, what it shows is that if we look at an embryonic human, you'll see a lot of these highlights that I mentioned a second ago. So look at this embryonic human on the right. And you'll notice that it has a lot of similarities to a generalized vertebrate organism. And so really when we talk about the human body plan and we reflect upon those highlights, what it shows is it shows the unity of life, right? It shows the unity of life and how uh, organisms have evolved from, uh, from common origins. Okay, so what functions... Um, uh, of the body cavities and the membranes exist in humans. So, so when we talk about humans, we talk about different body cavities, and we'll talk about this much more in later lectures and throughout this course, but we want to know what is inside each cavity. It helps us uh, to understand the function of the body as well. So for example, humans have a cranial cavity. It contains the brain. Uh, they have a vertebral cavity. It contains the spinal cord, thoracic cavity, right? The hearts and lungs. Abdominal cavity uh, contains digestive organs. And then the pelvic cavity uh, for part of the urinary system as well as reproductive systems. So this is an overview on this slide, but in later uh, lectures, we're going to zoom into these cavities and talk about, you know, what are the anatomical features that are there? What organs are there? And then what is their physiology? You know, what is their function? On the right-hand side of this slide, you just see a different view with some of these same cavities mentioned. Okay, so again, let's continue this discussion. What are the functions of the body cavities and the membranes? Well, these cavities are classified as something called serous cavities, right? And they're slit-like spaces surrounded by something called a serous membrane. And you might say, okay, well, what is the serous membrane? Well, there's basically something called a parietal serosa, and then there's a visceral serosa. And when we talk about this, it's basically a double membrane uh, structure that has an internal cavity to it. And the best way to illustrate this, sort of in a schematic way, so if you were to take your hand and push it into a balloon that was blown up, so you're not popping the balloon, but you're pushing your hand into it, so it's a very flexible balloon, <laughs> you'll see that the outer portion of the balloon main, remains intact, right? So that outer portion would be analogous to something uh, called the, uh, the parietal serosa. Right, that would be the outer part. The inner part of the balloon, right, that inner membrane where your hand pushed into, would be something called uh, basically the visceral serosa. And then the space in between those two, where you have the air, that would be analogous to the serous cavity. And so that's what we're really talking about when we talk about these cavities. Where do you find these? Well, they're all over the body. Here's just one example. Uh, you find them basically in the lungs. Right? So you find them lining the lungs. Okay, so a few more odds and ends before we finish up our lecture here. So you might ask yourself a question, how do clinicians diagnose disorders, right? When someone comes in, how do they diagnose disorders? Well, they might, there's many ways, obviously, but one thing they might do is they might take a superficial anatomy approach, as I mentioned on one of the earlier slides. So let's say someone's having abdominal pain. They might ab divide the abdomen, right, into different quadrants here, with, with the uh, origin being the belly button. This would be the upper right quadrant, the upper left quadrant, the lower left, the lower right. Remember, we talk about the anatomical right, right? Not your right, but the anatomical right. And so if someone comes in and says, oh, I have this like pain in my upper right quadrant. So notice the communication between the patient and the physician. We got to know what right is, right? So if they're saying, you know, anatomical right, we have a pain there. The physician might say, oh, what's underneath that? And if you look at the schematic, we know the liver's there, the gallbladder's there. Perhaps that person's having issues with their gallbladder. On the other hand, if someone says, ooh, I have pain in my upper left quadrant of my abdomen, then the physician might know if they know their anatomy, which I'm sure they will, they might say, ooh, maybe there's something going on with your spleen that we should look at. So this is how superficial anatomy can help inform a discussion between a clinician uh, and his or her patient. Okay, so that was our first introduction to the human body. Remember, we talked about an overview of anatomy. We talked about something called gross anatomy. And also, we hit all these different learning objectives. So before you proceed to the next lecture, if you need to watch this one again, I encourage you to do that. But make sure you can, are able to execute these different learning objectives that you see here. If you're able to do that, then you know you have a solid understanding of this lecture at this time.